Good afternoon. My name is Greg Missingham. I'm a honorary principal fellow at in the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning at the University of Melbourne. I'm going to talk about numbers of paper gardens or Western attitudes to, let's see here. Here we are. Notes on Western attitudes to Chinese gardens since 1860. This talk is based on an annotated bibliography of over 1,580 items, uh, which is on, which will be on, certainly by the time you see this, on ResearchGate and Academia Edu. It consists of about 1,580 items. Now, in 18, 1986, Patrick Connor claimed that English ideas of what constitutes Chinese garden change with the information received. This is very clear in uh, Bianca Maria's Rinaldi's 2016 Ideas of Chinese Gardens Western Accounts. Terrific work. In the introduction, Rinaldi leaves us with two strong impressions. One is that the interest in Chinese gardens was primarily to serve it as other in European discussions of how they should do their own gardens, of garden styles, and particularly so in England. Um, they weren't in, there wasn't an intrinsic interest in things Chinese, you might say, except as oddities or curios. And it was fun, fundamentally an Orientalist interest because especially uh, an, until late in the 19th century, um, it was based on fabulations as to what Chineseness in gardens actually constituted. Andrew Sear calls this Chinesia as being what they were being responsive to. This is a 1998 book of his. Now, the second thing Rinaldi lets us understand is that the level of interest in Chinese gardens correlates with the esteem in which the Chinese governments held by Europeans. Of, we, of these, we will see that the latter impression is somewhat supported in what follows, but the first next to completely abandoned. The talk is in four sections, dates, topics, approaches, and futures. I will spend most of the time actually considering, considering the period from 1981 to 2020. The 1860 of the title, and in Rinaldi's book, refers to the sacking of Yuan Mingyuan, the Garden of Perfect Clarity, by British and French troops in that year. We'll begin. Now, Craig Clinus has this to say. And in and the chapters in his book are the fruitful garden, the aesthetic garden, the gardens of the Wen family, the represented garden, and the landscape of number. In the Ming, it means numerology rather than its modern sense of mathematics. And it's nor in the sense I'm, I'm using here, it here to mean some kind of um, alpha. Uh, numeric historiography. All right. John Dixon Hunt had something a little richer to say, I think. This is a much stronger point. Serious scholars have tried to see the gardens from Chinese points of view. Chinese points of view at different times in history from different parts of the country. And that's a big change from the, uh, the periods that Rinaldi was reported uh, is translated and included. Perhaps what they found even insisted or prompted the reflexive interest that Clunas notes. All right, so now let's look at dates. For your interest, these are 
This is the materials with which we're commonly dealing. Not only Jiangnan Gardens, I'm gonna show you some other ones along the way. This talk as a numerical historiography is a mild one. For those who find such things fascinating, I recommend you have a look at uh, Zhang Yichi and Wang Zhou, Chinese Garden Research in the 21st Century International Academia, a diachronic analysis of the um, studies in the history of gardens and designs landscapes and Dumbarton Oaks papers. Okay. That paper includes more serious mathematical treatments in Chinese sources. All right. So let's begin. This is the period, this is a graph of the numbers of publications for five year periods from 1870 to 2020. I've left out about a decade, um, partly because there wasn't very much published, a few uh, letters to the editor in the uh, English newspapers complaining about the sacking and other sources in Europe. Um, and I stumble across them rather later. So what can we see in belonging and long end belonging in Chinese garden history? Stan Fong suggests there were three peaks: the 1930s, so this would be these two here; the 1980s, which is presumably these two here; and the 1990s, which is these two here. What we cursed. What I will refer to as the, as the two great leaps, this one here in, in um, about 1990, and this one here in 95, I think needs some explanation. And we can see from Rinaldi's, Rinaldi's point about the esteem in which the Chinese government was held, that might be why there's so little publication in the 50s after, during the Korean War. Um, this, so let's see, what have we got? Got the Sino-Japanese War, first one, 94-95, 1894-95. We've got the Boxer Rebellion, a year either side of the change of um, centen centen century. We've got the Republic of China initiated on the... Um, 1911, perhaps I should have made more of it graphically. Then we have the Chinese Civil War, uh, warlords, and then it boiled down to the Guomindang versus the Communist Party, and it's resolved in 1949. Okay. The Second Chinese, Second uh, Sino Japanese War, um, finished at the end of the Second World War with the defeat of the Japanese in the Pacific. This is not a very good time. Then we have, in China, we had the Cultural Revolution. And then finally, economic reforms of Deng Xiaoping. So from a um, a political point of view and our interest in China, China was a rough place over that period. Okay, now, the French recognized the Republic of China very early on, and then they recognized the People's Republic of China, again, very early on, relatively speaking, during the Viet, um, open, opening of the Vietnam War. Gough Whitlam, the then minister, of, um, head of the Australian opposition and the year after um, prime minister, visited in 71, Nixon visited in 72. Uh, Margaret Thatcher visited six or seven times from the mid eighties. And Helen Clark from New Zealand visited early in this century. Now, why do I pick these countries? They're, as you'll see, the five most prolific publishers of papers or items. Okay, now, Chen Bufong, check that guy's name right, 
Chen Bong Fu, sorry, invented the, the Tsangjia method, input method for entering Chinese characters into a computer using a standard keyboard in this period, 71 to 76, I think, 77, 78, sorry. The, um, the point about that is that it now made it easy to use conventional computers for Chi Chinese scholars working in China. So you, one of the ways you could interpret that graph is that it's a rising up from once the Chinese scholars in China got involved. Right. Now, we have a couple of other comments on this scale to work with. One is that arrow designates the centroid of all items I could find of the um, in other words, half the publications are after that arrow, 2001, and half are before in the total history of this literature. Um, the ones in Rinaldi would make little difference to the result, as it turns out. But I've included everything I could find in English, so the quality is quite variable. And... Alison Hardy has a remark to make about that. She points out that between 1949, when Seren's book, Gardens in China, came out, and then Maggie Keswick's um, Chinese Gardens book in 1978 came out, that there wasn't much scholarly interest published. I'd have a few quibbles about that, but let's take a for being roughly right. Okay, now I'm going, I'm going to change scale. Oh, one of the public one one of the um, grounds on which we might think that uh, this acceleration took place was that there were more outlets for publication after the Second World War. So this is the um, in both character in both incarnations the uh, studies in the history of gardens and design landscapes came into being. Orientations is the second. These are the four publication journals which have the most publications included in the bibliography. Chinese Heritage Quarterly. Orientations comes out of Hong Kong. Chinese Heritage Quarterly comes out of the Australian National University in Canberra. And Garden History uh, came from this period. All right, so there's some suggestion that the most prolific set of publications in at least at the journal level, um, started after the Vietnam War, or roughly speaking, during that period. And that might be a reason for this bulk. We'll get more to that. OK, we can go back to a yearly um, scale. And as you can see, there's a the red line at the bottom is the number that published in that each year. Um, and I've divided it according to articles and book chapters, books, collections, and theses. Collections are things like conference papers and um, edited, edited volumes. As you can see, there's not a lot of them. They're, they're just about the same as the number of theses. Although not all those theses are PhDs or um, master's degree theses. All right. We have Deng Xiaoping was the um, supreme leader in China in the period we, as we start this, these two decades. Notice there's no wars that, are, that particularly affect China. Uh, Tiananmen happened there and we have a dip. So this is maybe a uh, dip in publication. So maybe the government, uh, the Chinese government didn't do too well with um, those writing. Um, Jiang Zenming came in, Hong Kong handover. A lot of people might have thought that that was counterintuitive on Rinaldi's conjecture. All right. Then we have the GFC. Sorry, I missed somebody. Um, who did I miss? Hu Jintao. There's, there's, there's a couple of bumps in there that uh, 1982, 1986 that might lead to some other explanations. But the GFC, 
seems to have caused some problems maybe afterwards. Um, and our present Ch Chinese leader, Xi Jinping, um, and we can see an average drop off quite a lot after he arrives. The exercises in the South China Sea and the Hong Kong protests. Um, and you might expect that the 2020 publications were affected by COVID. Um, I think the 2021 ones have been, but I'm not so sure about the others. Okay, this is the centroid again. And what we've lost is a couple of hundred publications out of the total. Um, in other words, if I study this period, 40 years, 20 years either side of the change of century, um, it's a really good representation of uh, what's actually been going on. All right, so this is the, on the model of COVID projections of seven day averages, I've got seven year averages here. And that's how they bounce around. Generally an upward trend with a kickover in this last period. Okay. Now, one of the explanations you might have is, oh, look, it's got to do with computers. So this is when the internet officially began, that first blue dot. Then we have the World Wide Web. Now that might be a stronger indication of why things happened. And then Google. Uh, Netscape was available. The first search engines were really quite early in the 80s. Um, Netscape was two years before Google. So maybe that's a contributing factor. Now, let's look at publications as catalysts. This was Maggie Keswick's um, The Chinese Garden, the second edition in 86. That might have contributed to a, a kick up again. And then it might have kicked, 2003 might have contributed to another provocation. Then we have Alison Hardy's translation of uh, Yuan Ye. But the one that the literature seems to give all the credit to, or a lot of the credit to, is Craig Clunas' Fruitful Sites, from which we've seen a quote earlier. Um, and I think there might be a reason why you can, you can legitimately attribute quite a lot of the effect to Clunas's contribution. All right. This one here is Rinaldi's book. And that one's the recent Hardy and Campbell collection of translations of writings um, by Chinese across history on their own gardens. Um, fantastic pair of books. Um, I was aware of when Stan Fung um, started that, pub, that, that collection going, he was with another publisher at the time, um, back in the eighties. So it's taken a long time for it to come out through a series of different editors and writers. Okay. So explanations. How do we explain this sheer quantity of material and why it's got the dips that it has? Well, the quantity is easier to explain, I think. Um, you, after Deng Xiaoping, in fact, in the 1940s, late, soon after, and 50s, soon after the communists had taken over, um, a lot of work was done on the renovation of the gardens. And there was increased accessibility since the late 70s, after Deng Xiaoping's reforms. The art was, and China was turned outwards. Um, allowed um, what is in effect a capitalist economy to run rife. The rise of China as economic and military power, you think might be one explanation. You get interested in, and for some people know thine enemy. Um, okay, expansion of tertiary education in China, which allowed opportunities for exchange for Europeans, Westerners, um, for the I, I should point out for the sake of this exercise, I'm going to treat uh, even Japanese as Westerners as compared with China. All right, scholars. The increased uptake of tertiary education after World War II in Western nations. 
and there was construction of new universities all over the world um, and new schools that were producing scholars taking an interest in, in China. All right. There was an increased participation of women in education per se um, and in these periods, in these fields, of course. And there were new publication outlets, as we saw, and I'll do something. I'll have a look at these in more detail. And there were new schools of thought, especially in the humanities, widening the list of those who can contribute in this field. This is essentially what Clunas is being credited with, provoking this. The internet and search engines, especially Google in 1996, made these sort of, um, made studies possible. For example, I couldn't have done this paper without um, spending a lot of time on the computer. All right, now output opportunities. Let's have a look, periodicals. Um, the four main periodical, PR, periodicals are these. And there are 259 periodical, periodicals listed in the bibliography. And these four contribute about 18% of the output, but particularly studies in the history of gardens and design landscapes in its early and later manifestation. 55 articles. Um, of the 585 items. So around about a little, certainly some, somewhere over th a third of all, all papers. Now the publishers, this might interest quite a few of you, Harvard University Press is the most prolific, followed by the University of Hawaii Press, Routledge and Princeton. Now I'm aware of course that there's Australians are particularly aware of this, is that um, the deals between publishers across the Atlantic um, carve out, um, many of these could be listed in other ways. Uh, I don't think it's true, true of the University of Hawaii or Harvard. All right. They produce 627 volumes from 301 publishers. So, so proportion, you might say, of books is quite high. Um, 74 university presses are involved, 21 museums or galleries, and 12 learned societies. Okay, now theses. I've, here I'm only listing the, the PhDs or master's degrees. 35 universities are involved, including University of California, Princeton, Harvard and Chicago, and then Sheffield, Sydney and Yale. So that gives us some idea of where the activity is going on. Basically, the vast majority of it is occur occurring in the United States. All right. Now, here's a uh, belong map by half decades, five year groups of articles and books, chapters. And what I've done is teased out uh, the contribution of women, particularly. I've called the rest others' publications, because uh, there's a lot of, lot of people with very common names who I am unable to track down on the web as to whether they're male or female. Um, and sometimes there are publications that don't have cited authors, and sometimes the publications are from uh, journals or publishing houses. All right. So this, this is what we get. Now, remember that the big, the big um, leaps are at the end of 85, so in other words, here, and they're again in this period here. And what we can see, even back here, is there's a bump in the 30s in the participation of women. There's 50, over 50% 50 of the pu publications in 75 were there, and 51% in, sorry, um, 51% um, in the late 80s. And after that, you get this leap in publications, the, the two leaps. So maybe you could, one, one of the possible ways to explain it um, is that it's a function of the number, number of women getting involved in the, in the field. All right, there's another one. 
a different kind of explanation. This is the 10 most prolific authors of items spread over the dates of those 40 years. Um, and you can see that Stanform has done more articles um, than anybody else. And Craig Clunas has done the next most, but Cla Craig's produced eight books amongst those. Um, Stan has not produced a book. Um, G Jeremy Barme is the editor of um, um, China Heritage Quarterly, which starts then. And most of those articles are published by him in that, in that quarterly. Um, Hard translated, uh, as I said, Yu Yuan, the, um, the Craft of Gardens, Chi Cheng's book from what, 1625 or thereabouts. Um, and he, with Duncan Campbell, the New Zealander, the black wine there, um, produced uh, the most recent public, publication in 2020, the um, translation of all those Chinese writings. All right. Um, this is Mazik uh, Keswick's book that created the fuss originally is back here, of course. Um, this is a small article. This is the second edition. One of the, one of these is the second edition of book, and this is the posthumous third edition of a book. Now, if they haven't done that for other authors, I, I think that. Um, Keswick's contribution is a particular kind of one. Okay. Zhao Hui produced a book here, 2011, which is epitomizes the kind of depth that's involved. Now, I'm an odd fish out on this list because um, I'm not an art historian sort of scholar. I don't read Chinese. But I got included because of these two papers, invited to do this because of these two papers. First one on gifts over garden walls. Um, I gave it a conference on Chinese architectural history in Beijing. And the second one is in landscape research, which is a comparison of the numbers of gardens of Chinese style outside China as compared with the number of Japanese gardens outside China. All right, next. This is an obvious other interest in this sort of thing. Who publishes all these things? Well, you can see that the United States produces most, but they weren't the first. The first was England. Um, Eitel's book on feng shui, um, and a couple of one one book on Yuan Meng Yuan, and one book on or article on its sacking. These six here belong to one person, Emil Brecht. British Schneider. He was an Estonian Russian. Remember, Estonia didn't exist as a separate country. And he, were, he was a, essentially a plantsman working as an agricultural advisor and things of that kind, as a biologist all over um, the Russian Empire. Then you have the United States gets involved, uh, France, Germany soon after. And this little bunch here is mostly. Uh, the Swedes, but it's Siren. And Japan was early involved as well. Now, the, clearly, um, United States and United Kingdom are then the most prolific um, involved. All right. So that's got to do with numbers. Now let's look at So those are the most prolific countries. Publishing in English, remember. Um, New Zealand is a, an anomaly, and we'll see why. They've got a particular interest that gets them hot under the collar. Oh, actually, enthusiastic is a better description. So let's now look at topics. This is how I divided the topics intuitively before I got very far into this. Um, a group of topics to do with the gardens themselves. Um, my initial reaction was that Yuan Mingyuan, the Garden of Perfect Clarity in Beijing, or the ruins of it, 
and its history were one of the major issues and Suzhou Gardens were another major issue. We'll have a look at that in a minute. Um, and then paintings and texts of gardens and landscapes became of great interest. This was part of John Dixon Hutt's point that I, that I showed you earlier. Um, and then there was the complexity space, lots of discussion of what it feels like to be in a garden, how is it designed, what's the context of it? Um, that's what's going on in that group. Then chinoiserie, argument over Jardin Anglo Chinois, as you can imagine, and Sharawaji and chinoiserie itself um, occur quite a bit. It's telling who's most interested in that topic. Chinese style gardens outside China, and it's got a curiosity in it. And the cultural comparisons and politics, Yuan Ming Yuan, that's one of the main reasons it's success, particularly for the French. It's a comparison between Versailles and Yuan Ming Yuan. And there's quite a few people, but particularly Americans interested in comparative philosophy. Um, they're also interested in collections of scholars' rocks, those curiously shaped rocks that uh, scholars have on, on their desks. Um, and this is a suggestion that comes about for that, why that might be so. Um, generally speaking, collections of scholars' rocks are in museums, and it's the museum curators that write about exhibitions of them. Okay. Plant hunters, as you'd expect, that's a continuing interest that occurs right through history. So now we'll look. Um, here we are. This is the long period, and that's Brent Schneider up there at the top, and I think one Englishman, um, starting here. And then we can see um, Feng Shui and Dayer's thinking was right off the mark and gets really interesting to people up, up here. Architecture and urban design starts very early. Culture and comparisons are very early too. Um, but you can see some other topics like the rocks in Penjing start during the Second World War and after. Um, but other ones are particularly interesting. Oh. <clears throat> The academic interests is you've got one outline, one outlying bibliography here, but then things like uh, conference proceedings, um, historiography and bibliographies occur quite late, Vietnam or afterwards. So you have to suspect that's once the um, university seriously get underway. All right. <clears throat> if you add all the design and context ones up, you've got 473 items, 375 items directly on the gardens. An awful lot of those, that big blob inside gardens themselves are general surveys of, of Chinese gardens. Uh, we'll see some more about that in a minute. Okay. Foreigners' interests occupy about 199 papers, so they're quite perfect, but academic interests on this categorization that I'm giving about 38. All right, here's the actual gardens spread out of the same period. And we can see that the biggest group is on Chinese gardens generally. Um, and the surveys of gardens as compared with the design issues and representations, really treatments of them, are not all that different, about three to two. Then we have um, Jiangnan Gardens, so if you, um, in a 2020 talk, Alison Hardy made the observation that um, if you go down and buy a picture book on Chinese gardens, you almost certainly get Suzhou Gardens as the topic of the book. Occasionally you'll get something on Imperial Gardens. Now the other group is what I've called, is the group around Yuan Ming Yuan. And there's several issues, the sacking and the ruins and the loot what happened to it, occupy lots of people's attentions. Um, most, recent, most recently, this century, there's been quite a few books who actually looked very hard at the garden itself and what, what it was like and 
what was there. Um, and there's even people admitting that it wasn't totally ruined. There is a, some original buildings surviving. Okay. The specific other gardens or regions is larger than those two, but I've kept it as not so important, not so um, telling because there are, um, I know there's one book on, one article on Sichuan Gardens. There's another article on Tianjin Gardens. Um, of the garden, of the 50 odd gardens I visited, I know about some in Chongqing, Wuhan, um, that are, have not been reported, um, some in Fujian that I've never been to, um, and so on. But the biggest group of them, or the most prolific group of, of items published are on those that are in and around Canton, which we now call Guangzhou, in Guangdong province. Uh, and this is, none of the gardens are actually in Guangdong itself. All right. Now, Chinese style, style gardens elsewhere occupies quite a lot of attention from a lot of people. Um, some of the other imperial gardens and the, um, the Summer Palace group built under the uh, Qing outside the uh, north and east of the Great Wall occupied some time. Mostly the Qingde and Yuan Yim, um, Yuan Ming Yuan publications, or not most, quite a lot of them, have to do with the fact that there were a um, series of engravings um, published and copies of them went to Europe very early on in the um, early part of the 19th century. So that got a lot of people interested. And they're often the first um, images that Europeans saw of Chinese gardens. And they were seeing images of imperial gardens rather than the domestic ones. Finally, it is the craft of gardens, the book itself. Most of those publications are the largest number by Stan Fung. Okay, now, just to remind you what we're talking about, here's a map of China, Beijing located. The population centers, the three very large ones, and each of them is associated with an estuary. The Wanghe estuary, Yellow River estuary, Changjiang, the Yangtze estuary, and the Pearl River estuary um, in the south. The locations of the key centers for gardens, and by this I mean that these are the key areas that Chinese scholars are looking at. Um, the group I've called one here, and historically it goes Luoyang, Kaifeng, Chang'an, is the very early ones from the Tang Dynasty and earlier. Um, two is the when the Southern Sung, uh, Linan, uh, now known as Hangzhou. Uh, three, Beijing itself. Um, that square there is loosely what we call Jiangnan. It's roughly a 200 kilometer square. And it has all those cities there listed that belong in there. And that's where the books get referred to as the Jiangnan books, uh, sorry, Jiangnan Gardens. Um, Five is Lingnan, south of the uh, mountains, you might say. Um, and it has those sites of gardens. And the last, uh, sorry, then Huizhou, which is a province in Anhui province. Historically, Jiangsu and Zhejiang are the most wealthiest provinces in China, the, the two that contribute most singularly to Jiangnan. Anhui is the place where at the fall of the dynasties, the wealthy families retreated to their, um, their family villages up in the hills until the, until the um, chaos at the change of dynasty settled down. And they made garden, small gardens there, which Chinese scholars have got interested in. Finally, there's Chengde, northeast of... Um, it's got two other names, depending on which, in which way you're referring to it, Jehol or Reher. Okay. Let's look at the top. Here's that list of topics again, and I've distributed it according to countries. 
the most, sorry. Here's, here I've distributed according to, sorry, and I apologize for that. Here we have 35 countries, all of the countries that are mentioned in the bibliography that I can discover the authors of, where they come from. Um, now you can see there's a lot of big blank areas here. So what I did was I reduced, if I kept only those countries for which there were five publications or more, and that looks like this, and there's 16 of those countries. The most common item is looking at gardens themselves, um, followed by uh, rep their representations um, and the architecture of them, you might say. Now, the United States is most prolific, United Kingdom, Australia, France, and New Zealand. And the numbers are slightly different to the previous group because of what I'm looking at. Um, in that other case, it was when they were published. So often you can know the date, but not where the author's from. Okay, now, the left blue line is the Atlantic and the right blue line is roughly the east coast of uh, Eurasia. All right, so I've, I've taken out a whole lot of countries. Now, a couple of interesting things occur. Now, we have a look at individual countries. The United States is most interested in representations of things. Now, Sherman Lee in 1972 in Burlington Magazine, strikes me as the kind of remark you might have expected there, made the comment that the only real market for Chinese painting was in the United States. So that might be why an awful lot of the discussions of Chinese paintings are coming from the curators of the museums that hold them. Um, from a Chinese point of view itself, uh, John Dixon Hunt made clear earlier, and it's clear in the papers themselves, that they often didn't distinguish between the gardens or their representations, models, texts, paintings, um, in terms of their responses and what the gardens were actually about. All right. Next most prolific is the UK and it has different um, secrets. You know, it's, it's second most important topic is, is that this is about Shinwazri and Chinese influences. And uh, it's interested in the representations. Then we have Australia and Australia's interests are the gardens first, then the architecture, then Feng Shui. For, uh, there are two um, Australian authors, Skinner and Payton, who've published a number of books on um, feng shui. And there are, there's myself and the group around Michael Ostwald at the University of Newcastle that were working on what you might call experimental design on the model of experimental archaeology, uh, trying out different theories of how things were designed in order to test whether how close you could get to a result that looked like what's actually there. A designer's interest. Okay, now, finally, there's New Zealand, there's, oh, sorry, there's France, whose interests are in the same sequences as the United States. Interesting observation, historically. And finally, New Zealand. Um, and you can see they are, they out, publish anybody on Chinese style gardens elsewhere. That's probably because I was able to pick up quite a few popular pieces and newspaper items on um, the Dunedin Chinese garden when it was published, but also some of the more serious authors, Be Beatty and Duncan Campbell, um, James Beatty and Duncan Campbell have also published on um, Chinese style gardens in New Zealand. You'll see the other reason. Other reason that there's a la, new line introduced here: translations of Chinese text. That doesn't change the numbers of things because um, I've introduced it there just to draw attention to the fact that some of these are some of these papers come about because what you've done is you've ch translated a Chinese text, 
in order to comment on what it teaches you about the, the field that you're interested in or the position you're taking. Um, and BT and Campbell do quite a bit of that. All right, uh, we'll move on. Okay, let's now have a look at the approaches. We've, we've had a look at the numbers, we've had a look at the topics, and the numbers might uh, begin to, the reasons for them. And I was originally asked to talk about uh, what you might call Western attitudes to Chinese gardens and how they've changed. Um, and we're beginning to see now that the attitude is expressed as the position you take and why you're looking at these things. Now, Craig Clearness starts off particularly as against Orientalism, and this is the pithy way of putting it. And why was it known, particularly in the 19th century, is because the Europeans or the Westerners were telling us what China was like. This is what Andrew Hisier calls Chinesia. It's an invention of Western writers. And um, until the writers start being interested in the Chinese attitude to the garden, that doesn't get any richer. So Clunas in 96 in Fruitful Sites, his introduction sets out what he's on about. He's on for multiple approaches. And I listed his chapter headings earlier to show that he, he treats it from different five different perspectives. And he's against Orientalisms, as you should be aware. The garden shouldn't be extracted from other structures of knowing. So it's clearly an intertextual approach. And he wants you to keep in mind the problems of representation. The point he made in the in the earlier quote, um, he commends John Dixon Hunt's cultural history approach. He commends J. B. Jackson's and Dennis Cosgrove's inclusion of gardens in wider landscape and in, in, by implication, environmental discourses, which are re relatively recent. Um, no, Mark Elvin's book. Um, the Retreat of the Elephants is from the 70s. So it's not entirely real. Gardens and Landed Property. Um, Clunas' 1991 Superfluous Things started that discussion, and I'll have more to say about that later. Okay. Diane Harris, writing in the Landscape, Landscape Journal, not specifically about... Chinese gardens um, talks about the postmodernization of landscape history. And she says there is theory, theoretical developments, semi theories, feminist and post colonial theories that focus on recovering voices of the oppressed and marginal. Marginal here could also include things like talking about village gardens and village landscapes rather than central or imperial ones, or those of the landed gentry. Post-structuralism. Um, this has got to do with things like um, exploitation of people, um, uh, how our gardens themselves are expressions and participants in um, Economics and power. This is one of the one of the other kinds of turns in recent publications that people people are pointing out the difference. A the differences between the gardens. A simple example is um, if you're used to gardens in the Jiangnan area, you've got bull's blood uh, columns, whitewashed walls. Uh, grey capping, you know, architrave stones and grey roofs um, and plain ceilings. If you're in Beijing, you've got an imperial gardens, you've got incredibly colourful, colourful paintings along the ceilings um, as a difference. And you've got coloured roofs. If you're in Lingnan, Guang, Guangzhou, um, the columns are black, 
the woodwork is black, the walls are gray bricks, um, un unpainted, and the ceilings are beautiful pastel shades of paintings. If you're in Chongqing, the woodwork is unpainted. Um, so there's those sort of present variations, um, but that's the that's my architect's eye. Um, the texts that describe them differ, of course, and they differ them over differ over time. And yeah, last one, Chris. Okay, so those of you who are um, art historians, you will know you'll be familiar with quite a bit of these changes. Okay, and with landscape analysis increasingly frequently appearing in the work, um, Harris makes the point that it's increasingly appearing in the work of art, architectural and environmental historians, literary critics, anthropologists, archeologists, and scholars of material culture. So that what we're looking at and why we're looking at has changed markedly. All right, so this is my attempt to use Harris's classification with a few others I've thrown in, like the environmental, environment, nature concerns, experimental design, the mathematical analysis, phenomenology in space, people talking about their, um, how they feel in the gardens is quite a common thing. And what you can see from this list is that there's a continuous list of what I'm, I've, I can only describe as informational accounts. Now, much of this comes, I haven't read all of these, obviously, certainly not in this detail, um, but I have read the, uh, what I can of their introductions and their, um, the abstracts. So the informational history uh, is essentially history's function is to be diachronic, to give you the change over time. The other big group is, of course, here, the descriptive synchronic accounts. They're either analytic or they're comparative with both, well, both diachronic and synchronic analyses are inherently comparative. And the other big group is cultural studies. Let's look at the, the lumpiness of this. Um, here we are. This is the New Zealanders celebrating their Dunedin Gardens and a couple of other ones and other people looking at some gardens in Midwest United States and just one particular one in Australia, so in Sydney. Uh, then we have an interesting group of studies, which, which I'll get to when I'm talking about futures. Memory studies. Uh, we have some, this business about contextualizing of texts. This is not only, the text is inverted commas because we're talking about uh, ideas or we're talking about texts or we're talking about paintings or we're talking about the gardens themselves and how they're particularly particular to their location or to their time in time in history or to their the group that lives there. All right. Um, phenomenology and space has got a couple of interests. Um, cultural studies, you can see, improve, increases in uh, or corresponds to that acceleration period after um, Clunas' publication in this column. Um, might be inverted commas proof. Then we have the um, diachronic studies and the synchronic studies, which have been rattling along the whole time, but they, they again, both groups increasing number after the 20th century starts. All right. Now I'm gonna have a look at one more paper. And it's this one. And this comes from, this, this is a book on sinographies. Um, and it was reviewed by Ling Che Liti Chen in 1970, 2009. And her review um, introduces yet another way of characterizing these materials. Um, and quite a nice asymmetric in numbers. Sinology, or more usual now, China studies, she says. Um, this is, these are people who approach uh, 
Chinese matters in a sense um, from without because, because they're looking at China as a field. Right? Something, and then sinography, which is according to the editors that she's reviewing, um, as historiography is to history written by China specialists. And it comes from within, from e.g. Chinese literature training and from some other places you might not expect. She accuses all three editors of actually doing both, really. Accuses? Yeah, and she makes clear that they are aware that they're doing that. Okay. This kind of reflexive self-awareness amongst the writers is absolutely characteristic of the present period um, in writing on China. Right. And this and that second tendency, um, which is likely to be a much smaller group, but you can see how somebody like Clunas belongs to both groups. Okay. Okay, now we're on to the futures. Where does this take us? Well, Alison Hardy gave a talk at the Huntington earlier in 2020. I originally contacted it because I'd come across a, um, an abstract for a, a symposium at Sheffield in 2015 that she was going to talk about her, you know, she was going to talk about the previous 20 years. But she talked about, um, it was never published as a, a paper, but she got put me onto this one, uh, which you can contact yourself and look at and listen to. Um, but she, in this talk, she surveyed effectively publications that occurred over her career, um, 30 years of it. Self-representation of the garden owners was a major point she made. I'm going to take this one up again in a minute. In, yeah. And she, she thought that there was increasing interest in gardens as an autonomous space for the social lives and literary activity of women. Um, she got interested in a group of Chinese courtesans that appeared to be able to own the gardens in their own right. And if you've read uh, Hong Lao Min, the, the famous um, Qing novel, uh, chapter 17, well, sorry, the whole book is set in a very famous garden or Grandview Garden or um, uh, Dong Guan Yuan. Um, Hong Laman translates usually as the story of the stone or um, a dream of red mansions. It's a garden which might have two or three males in it and about 30 different women. Um, as we know, the males who owned the gardens were possibly because of the way they land holdings were held in those sort of families, that might have been their 10% of the year. But it would have been the, the garden would have been at the central family house in a particular city. All right. So that's why this, so it was mostly occupied by women for most of the time. All right. More general landscape issues, she thinks, have um, gradually been introduced. The gardens of academic institutions, the academies, um, early 20th century university campuses in China. I, I was chair of a student who finished PhD last year on um, essentially Baptist based, you know, four best Baptist based universities designed by Americans in collaboration with local architects. And Alison asked, to what extent were craftsmen, creative designers, how did they do that, et cetera. Now, we do know there was one family that um, worked for generations with the imperial family and an imperial sites. Um, so maybe they could be studied. I'll bring that up again. Okay. And I, what I characterized before as experimental design is an interest for a lot of architects once they come across the, once they come, and it's a general exercise set for architecture students in China. All right, 
Further, she thought that the th next things to look at were distinctive local traditions, and that's begun. Silbergeld's paper on uh, the Sichuan Gardens, um, Yang Yichi's, um, sorry, Zhang Yichi's um, interest in the Tianjin Gardens, etc. Okay, popular garden traditions. Here she's thinking obviously of agriculture and the connection. Uh, I think I've seen what there's one paper in the whole bibliography that talks about um, the intersection of agriculture and, and the design of the gardens. Um, there's mention of the medicine, medicinal herbs in Clunas and elsewhere. Temple or monastic gardens, Tracy Miller has looked at this in her uh, large book. But there's, in terms of uh, their design, I think uh, there are Korean writers have looked at uh, the tradition of monasteries in Korea that are richer. All right. The stylic, stylistic changes over time. Most of the survey books don't do this very well. You'll get a um, one or two images of um, Sung Dynasty gardens that are rather more formal. And there might be vestige, vestiges them in some of the temple gardens. There's one on the uh, west coast of the West Lake. There's one in Hanoi. There's a couple in um, Seoul that have a particular characteristic layout that hasn't survived, but that apparently was characteristic. Um, production of sound effects. Uh, Martin Fowler, an Australian classical pianist, avant-garde um, performer, who's written very extensively on Japanese gardens and sound landscapes. Uh, but I don't see it very much in... Um, Jung Yu has published one paper on soundscapes and music in Chinese gardens. Now, the intersection, Alison didn't think there was very much on the, at a scholar level, on the intersection between gardens and feng shui. I've included in the bibliography, I know two books that try to deal it, but they're aimed at uh, domestic gardeners. Okay. And Alison would like to see more research into the evidential value of the texts and images, you know, Sure, they're there, but I can think, for example, um, Wang Jumin, uh, 1553 um, album on uh, George Engyuan, the garden, uh, the humble administrator's garden in Suzhou. There's one particular image that I have on, oh, I don't have it on my wall, I have a different one on my wall. Um, where a man is standing in a rock gazing across the lake. And the lake looks as though it's around about the width of the West Lake. And there's some mountains on the other side. Now, the scene actually exists in the garden. The rock is even there. But the rock is only about a metre and a half long in the actual garden. And the width of the waterway is about 15 metres. And the height of the mountains on the other side are maybe 10. Um, so there's something about making a drawing of the feeling rather than the actual thing that occurs regularly in the text and images. All right. Now, the other possible future studies. Here I'm nearly finishing. A book on the con contribution of the lay family designers to the imperial palaces, I think would be a good thing and um, would be useful for somebody to take up. Uh, study the influence of the design of private cemeteries on the design of the gardens. The, the I was given a clue in a 2001 conference in Hangzhou by an official from the Hong Kong government who looked at an architect who looked after the, uh, the huge public cemeteries. And he thought, said there were um, Chinese texts that talked about, uh, particularly the feng shui of the private garden and layouts. Um, that would, would result in different theories of feng shui if you looked at them. 
for example. Um, I think there could be a consolidated uh, politi political economy of Chinese gardens. I'm thinking of uh, Roderick Flood's book, An Economic History of the English Garden. Fantastic book. And there's certainly enough material and people working on the economics um, in small parts. Uh, again, Clunas makes references to this in Fruitful Sites. It's implied in the title. Um, but not, there's nothing like Flood's book yet. That's an opportunity for somebody. Um, a consolidated treatment of memory studies. This might be a bit left field for some people. Um, but it's clear from, say, John Dixon Hunt's comments that when you look at a garden, and um, Hardy and others are clearly aware of this, that, that often they're about assessing the value of the owner, not about the value of the garden or the qualities of the garden. Um, in the way that the Chinese literature talks about, about their, their own gardens. And you can have um, even more book, uh, there's recent books, the one, um, it's Wei Ho's book, uh, which make clear that the, what you might, the meanderings, the musings, the um, phenomenological experiences of, of the owner are thought to be constitutive in a kind of um, feedback loops way of the personality of the owner. Now, I would send people to Malafurus Lambros's book, How Things Shape the Mind, um, on this, and it's what you might call, uh, what he calls, I think, archaeology of the mind. And this is part of that movement that talks about the way in which human beings as cultural persons have their mind invested in objects outside their skull. Um, so I'd recommend that for some people interested in such things. Um, so I'd like a consolidated treatment experimental design approaches. Possibly I'd have to do it myself. And a literary geography, or there may be some Chinese um, student uh, writers who might want to do it, or maybe it's already been done in Chinese. Um, finally, the literary geography of classical Chinese literature. Now, literary geography is a European movement that, that comes particularly in literature. What the interest is, is, um, for example, a PhD student I had who finished about five years ago, wrote about a series of novels settled in Melbourne. And what he did was he tracked ge geographically um, the unfolding of the plot. So, and over a period of 30 years, he showed how the, therefore the interest and understanding of the city shifted with time. And there seems to be certainly enough literature on um, Chinese cities, uh, particularly, but, but even though it's poetic primarily, which would allow you to, to do a similar thing, to be able to track who was where, um, and what's the tendency in their understanding of the city and so on over time. So I'll leave that one for other people to look at. So I think I'm finished. Um, it's the literary geography one. So thank you very much. Um, I've listed at the end of these slides, um, and I'll be sending the copy of the slides to um, your organizers um, um, to make available to anybody who's particularly interested. But use my email address um, if you've got any particular questions. So thank you.